Hello and welcome to Baseball Barbacast, the only baseball podcast in the world that would have given up just 13 runs in one inning to the Arizona Diamondbacks. I'm Jake Mintz, and that's Jordan Schusterman, and we would have stopped the bleeding a little bit earlier. Yeah, no homers, though. You know, killing them softly. The snakes were in the desert against the Rockies of Colorado. Probably not going to spend too much time on that game as we recap opening day 2024 on this Friday edition of Baseball Barbacast. As you can see, Jake and I are both in hotel rooms. I am still in Cincinnati after the Reds opening day win over the Washington Nationals. Uh, Jake is in Baltimore still, I believe, and will be headed up to Philadelphia to see another opening day. Wow, look at look at you getting to, to two different opening days. Very exciting. Um, so while we are not able to talk about the, the epic Spencer Strider, Zach Wheeler, matchup because it has not happened yet uh, we have plenty else to talk about because the baseball season has officially begun first we will recap the games we saw with our own two eyes and then we will bounce around the league and try and say at least one thing about every game that happened on uh, on thursday where's your heart at jordan like how you feeling having ball back was there a moment yesterday for you where it kind of dawned on you that we are we've returned to the flow of things yeah i mean honestly and i'm, I'm kind of jumping ahead but like to me, it's, you know, we have all kinds of goofy, again, I, I mean, I'm going to talk about it. Nick Martini hit two home runs, right? First multi-homer game of the season. That kind of moment, you know, in spring training three days ago, nobody notices, nobody cares, right? Maybe it gets to mention, oh, the team accounts. We said, But for, for <laughs> when it counts and when it's in front of a sold-out crowd, even if he'll never replicate it for the rest of the season, who cares? It just all feels so much more. And, and you know that like, oh, like not only are these stats going to mean something, but this is now a part of their season, you know, and if the Reds go on to make the playoffs or whatever, it will begin with Nick Martini hitting two home runs. <laughs> right. You, you know that you're watching f- memories in real mm-hmm. time, mm-hmm. whereas yes. in spring training, you are watching things you will immediately forget. And so <laughs> yes. besides all of the the pomp and circumstance of opening day and the reminder that we're back in the rhythm of our lives, the idea that we are uh, taking in things that matter, that have relevance, that have importance is something that I really love. Speaking of things that have relevance and importance, let's begin in the charm city, Baltimore, Maryland, where opening day carried a little bit more heft than usual. Now, this was not supposed to be the first game of the day. The Mets and the Brewers were supposed to uh, pitch off. Is it? I'm going to start saying pitch off. It's like kick off. This was to pitch off uh, at one o'clock Eastern Time. Philly and Atlanta was supposed to be three o'clock, and the Orioles were supposed to be three o'clock as well. But rain in New York and Philly meant the Orioles kicked off, pitched off the 2024 stateside baseball season. A lot of qualifiers. Um, And it was a very appropriate place, I felt like, for the season to begin because um, the energy in the stadium, I was there, obviously, was unbelievable because I'm trying to think about how to put this. Most fan bases are pessimists, okay? And I think that that is fair because 29 teams lose. And so 29 fan bases spend the winter being like, oh, well, you know, we screwed it up again. And so fandom is inherently like irrationally positive, but like at the end of the day, also pessimistic. And the Orioles in the 21st century as a franchise have been such a bizarre embarrassment and disaster, except for that lovely 2012 to 2016 stretch, right? And so there was this feeling, it was like, are good things really happening (laughs) to the Baltimore Orioles? Like, is this really it, like pinch me? Am I? Is this real life? Well, well, and not just that, right? But also when you you know you mention how a season ends, and you think about how the Orioles' season ended, right? Um, particularly with with how they showed at home in, in the postseason. Now, I think even with that, there is obviously going to be a lot of reason for optimism. Uh, even, you know, if you woke up the day after the Orioles were eliminated or the day after they're, they're, they lost that game in the postseason against Texas, you still would have said, you know what, we're going to be feeling pretty optimistic on opening day. But to have not only announcing the new ownership, but Corbin Burns on the mound for that game must have, I assume, amplified it so much. Oh. We have to, of course, begin with the ownership part of it, and then we can get to the actual game. 
so this all happened pretty quickly. Um, David Rubenstein. It is Rubenstein, not Steen. I learned yesterday. Jordan, we need <clears throat> someone smarter than us to do a global Steen Stein breakdown. Who are the Steens? Who are the Steins? Who are the Gold Steins? Who are the Gold Steens? Why? Where? When? You would someone think do that. we would know anyway, this Dave, by now, but shockingly no. not. No. So David Rubenstein uh, finalized his purchase of the Baltimore Orioles. He's the head of the new ownership group. Now, my understanding is that the timing here was kind of wild because I don't think Rubenstein was going to assume control of the team until Peter Angelos, the previous owner, passed away. Peter Angelos died within the last week. Now, the reasoning for that is that the control person of the Orioles uh, in Peter Angelos's stead while he was incapacitated was his son, John Angelos. And I think the situation is that the way that the taxes work is that once Peter died, they save a lot of money by having it pass, some of that money passed down as inheritance instead mm. of a sale. Mm. That is my understanding. And so because of that, I don't think this sale was going to be finalized until Peter Angelos passed away. And he passed away at the age of 94 within the last week. And so what that meant was, the Rubenstein group was able very, I don't want to use the word serendipitous because someone died, but like the timing was, was notable in that way because they were able to get him installed, officially installed literally like 24 hours before opening day. And then they did the press conference yesterday morning, like at 11 a.m., uh, which was certainly a sight to see. Yeah, and so I guess I mean you were you were in the room. I know there were very some important Baltimore important Orioles people in the room. I know he went on the yeah. broadcast. I, I saw a snippet of that. Um, of course, it's, it's you know vibes are good. Uh, they're they're you know kicking the Angels' ass, all all kinds of good stuff on the field yeah. too. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, Can I, any, let me just, take a minute. One, I want to explain. Yeah. I want to explain why. It, like why this is particularly notable in this place, in the city, because mm -hmm. like the Angelos era, that tenure, while there were certainly moments of success, mm -hmm. right, in the 90s, in 2012 to 2016, the overall like leadership, stewardship of the franchise was not good. The uh, franchise's place in the city went down the the franchise's place in like the baseball world declined as a front office before they hired Mike Elias they were behind the eight ball they weren't investing in Latin America Camden Yards which is still beautiful like needs some upgrades pretty notably and so like Orioles fans had come to expect like bad ownership and that is like all a lot of o Orioles fans had ever known. And so the idea that like it is the, the, the energy around the yard was like, this is a day that was never going to come, right? That the Angeloses were, were going to leave. And I heard stories of people like opening champagne, like when the Rubenstein news came out, like this is, was a celebratory moment in Baltimore. And so when you add that to an 101 win team and the best farm system in baseball and the 2021 NL Cy Young starting on opening day, it, it was all very pinch me. When is the other shoe going to drop? This can't be real life. Um, yeah. I'll, now I'll just briefly talk about the, the press conference itself. So that was super interesting for a number of reasons. Um, there was obviously the, the bridge collapse tragedy here in Baltimore earlier this week. And the governor, Wes Moore, my understanding is he had not taken questions yet about that because it happened this week. He was there to introduce Rubenstein and the question and answer session at the press conference kind of, I don't want to use the word devolved, but kind of morphed into like the, about the bridge, which like good, that's a good thing. Like that's more important than are the Orioles going to spend the money to sign Pete Alonzo or whatever. Right. right. Um, but it all just made for a, a slightly odd scene. Um, but th all the heavy hitters were there. Mayor uh, Brandon Scott was there. Cal Ripken, who's part of the new ownership group, was there. Eddie Murray was there. Hall, uh, Hall of Famer, former Oriole. 
uh, Ben Cardin, who's a senator, Maryland senator, was there. It was like a very like well done press conference. And the 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 thing that will really stick with me about Rubenstein specifically, he didn't use notes. He had he went up there for ten minutes, no notes, and just spoke off the dome very well. And like owners are in our understand like in our history, like they're bad at this. They are bad mm-hmm. at communicating to the public. <laughs> and to see Rubenstein go up there with no notes and stick the landing, look, I don't want to turn into owner worship on this podcast, but it was impressive. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. And I was going to say the two things I would say about that. One is, and I think we've referenced this when, you know, if we first got news that he was the one that bought the team. This is someone who is not just comfortable speaking publicly. The dude's got his own YouTube channel where he's interviewing all these other famous rich people and and whatever. Like he is he he is a a public speaker. He is not just a rich person who is like honestly in the way yeah. that like Steve Cohen was very famous because he's one of the richest people on earth, but he wasn't necessarily always out and about in front of cameras speaking to people, whatever. And we sort of feel that in the when you listen to him talk. Now he has other ways that he can be. Uh, kind of goofily charming, which again, to an to an extent, because these are still rich people that you don't necessarily <laughs> want to want to give too much credit for. Um, and to that point, too, like I'm sure at some point this will this will come back to bite him, and he'll say something that he probably shouldn't. But for now, as far as the opening oh, yeah. goes, it was as, it was as good as you could hope. It seems like, yeah. And then the game was, I mean, for the home crowd, even better. Corbin Burns was amazing. Mike Trout homered in the first inning, which was like good to see. Right. Like he got it was very vintage trout slider alone yep. away, got around it, lofted it out deep to left center field. Um, and it was like, oh, man, are the angels going to spoil this? No, no, they're not, because the <laughs> Orioles offense came uh, out in the bottom of the second and just um, swing decisioned their way back into yeah. the game and to an 11 to three victory bouncing Pablo, uh, Pablo Sandoval. God damn it, Jake. Patrick Sandoval early getting him out of the game, home runs from Cedric Mullins and uh, Anthony Santander. And it was a romp. It was a route. Seeing Anthony Rendon in person uh, not try particularly hard was funny. Him being the first plate appearance of the entire season was very funny to me. Uh, And all in all, uh, a good time was had at Camden Yards. That's my dispatch. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. And, and, you know, Orioles, Orioles want to know. And uh, I believe... Both of uh, the games that we saw, teams that we saw today, are you know are off today, right? So they get to yep. enjoy being uh, undefeated for at least a little bit extra. Um, and I will say, as far as a theme of the game, very similar thing. Uh, so I was in in Cincinnati for Reds Nats, and they were up, uh, I think, seven nothing by the end of the third. And so when you have that kind of game, uh, particularly for for the home crowd, that team gets up early on open day, you know. It's just a, a level of, of relaxation and kind of like we really can just like welcome back open day like, ah, baseball. Ah, I'm so happy. Mm. Like my team is winning. I don't have to stress. There's no there's no high leverage. It was the, the Reds opening day basically went perfectly to script in two ways. Uh, the first way was that Frankie Montas was fantastic. Oh. Now, the, the Nationals oh. lineup is not fantastic. So we don't have to go too far in that direction. But Frankie Montas, who I think even I, as someone who follows the Reds pretty closely now because they are the closest major league team to where I live, I was surprised to see this. But talking to people around the organization in spring training and leading up to the leading up to this day, um, they are extremely bullish on him. And, you know, for him, he said after the game, he's like, look, people know what I can do when I'm healthy. And it's we do, we, we're, we do this all the time. right? It's like, oh, well, he's hurt up oh, he, his shoulder. So there's no way he's ever going to be the same. Um, but yeah, he pretty much looked like yeah. Frankie Montas. I mean, he wasn't throwing quite as hard. He was, he was more 95, 96 than 97, 98. But the splitter was there. The command was there. Now, he had this early lead, so it didn't really matter. Um, so he was he was cruising. He was throwing strikes, and, and he looked great. Uh, so that was so that was cool. I was I was happy for happy for him just because he's clearly endeared himself very quickly to just everyone in that organization. So he's going to be a huge part of, of their of their season just because. The injuries to T.J. Friedel and Matt McLean. T.J. Friedel, who broke his uh, uh, wrist diving for a ball in spring training. Matt McLean, who had shoulder surgery. Those were their two uh, leaders in baseball reference war last year. So that is a significant 
deal for their offense uh, to start the season, and they're going to have to kind of deal with that. Now, Frieda will probably be back at some point in the first couple of months. McLean, I don't know if we're going to see him again this season. We don't know. So that is a huge deal for them. So the pitching is going to become all the more important. Um, but as I mentioned, the way that the game kind of went to script, they had that, and then they were able to finish the game by giving Brent Suter the Cincinnati native who signed back with the team that he grew up rooting for, he was able to to kind of close out the blowout with uh, with a couple scoreless innings. Brent Suter, of course, I think a lot of people who listen to this show know, is one of the more likable uh, humans that we have in our in our game. And he was he looked like I mean after the game he was like I'm dreaming, you know. Um, so we did the super crowd Brent Suter. know? Did the crowd know that like? he was a Cincinnati guy. Did they respond to that? I, I think in? so. Certainly by, again, when he came in, because they were already up by so much, it was a little bit kind of, and, and it was like, was, we weren't sure who was going to come in and close it out. It was a little bit different. But I mean, he, he like struck out the side. He like, it was, he was definitely throwing harder than normally Brent Suter does. And, and when he actually closed it out, it was, uh, it was, it was definitely more emphatic than you will ever you normally see from, from Brent Suter. You mentioned this earlier, uh, Nick Martini, two home runs. Yes. <laughs> uh, what the actual hell? Uh, yeah. I have a a friend who w- uh, worked worked for a major league team uh, at some point and recommended Nick Martini as like like he was like kept recommending Nick Martini over and over again, yeah. and the team never signed Nick Martini. And yep. I got a text from this person yesterday, being like, "Wow, <laughs> I knew it." So I was I right. was early. I was first. Well. Well, and the thing about it, that's why I say so. It, it went to script in in the you know the Montas and the, the Suter ways, but the Martini thing is is crazy. Um, you know, it's funny you you mentioned that anecdote because Martini's the perfect kind of player where it's like it's his whole career. You know, he he always got on base, but he's like never just quite enough. You know, secondary skills, or he was never quite just enough. He was just the definition of just like not quite. He didn't quite ever pop enough for major for a major league team to be like, here you go, Nick Martini, like go for it. To the point where this dude was in Korea in 2022, played a whole season for the NC Dinos, comes back, the Reds signed him to a minor league deal last year, and he was awesome. Like last two month and a half last year, he had a 9-12 OPS for the Reds, and nobody really noticed. He makes the team out of camp. He's starting a DH, batting eighth, and then he hits two home runs. First uh First red hit two home runs in opening day since Adam Dunn in 2007. He was obviously, you know, thrilled after the game. He's 33, first opening day roster for him. So that was another thing where it was like, again, like how you, you were not expecting to see that when you go there. And it was it was really cool. If Nick Martini becomes like a Max Muncy type, I just want to say right now, the bar for Martini related jokes is higher now than it was yesterday. Yesterday on opening day, two home runs. We can shake and not stirred. Like, uh, well, that's all fine. I just want to set a standard. I know. I know he did it on the broadcast. I want to set a standard as a community that if Nick Martini is going to be a character, we hold ourselves to high quality martini puns. That's all I'm saying. And I agree. I'm I'm totally with you. And I'm excited. You know, the next time I'm I'm uh, probably won't be back there this this weekend. But like again, like red social team too. Like. I don't, like how many how many captions do we have for the martini home runs? I know you can always throw the martini emoji in there, but it'll be interesting to see how creative they get. Opening day was fine. Like holy crap, Nick Martini homer twice. Get all the easy ones out. Let's just let's up the level. Uh, Jordan, anything else from Reds Nationals? The Nationals uh, did not look good. They no, could be one of the worst teams no. in baseball. Still, yeah. JoJo Gray, friend of the show, did not yeah. really have it. Um, similar yeah. thing for me watching the Angels. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. That team. Uh, might really stink. Um, yeah. The pitching in particular was was rough. And the, the one last thing quickly to hop back to the Angels. The Angels ownership situation has been such an embarrassment for so long with Artie Moreno. And to have the Angels be the foil for the like celebratory Orioles new ownership game <laughs> was particularly cruel. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's the other thing is I, I was thinking about that. It's just in terms of contrast between the Reds and the Nationals. I wrote a little bit about this um, in my recap for Yahoo about how, again, a year ago, Reds coming off 100 losses. They barely spent any money for the agency. And it was like, okay, how much longer are we going to suck? You know, the Nationals, too, were coming off 100 losses a year ago. And now here they sit kind of still in this 
morass of a rebuild where there is reason for optimism. We know the kids are coming, um, but it's compared to the Reds where it's like, oh, no, we have expectations this year. It was it was very, very stark yeah. uh, where the, how how fa- how far those two organizations had come in a year. Um, I think that said a lot. Uh, all right, Jake, let's take a break. Uh, and when we return, we are going to try and say at least one thing about all of the other opening day games that happened uh, before we end this podcast. So Jake can get to Philadelphia. We'll be right back. And welcome back to Baseball Barbacast, Jake Mintz, Jordan Schusterman, Friday morning, March 29th. Here's a question. Is it opening day still in Philadelphia? Um, yes. Is opening yes. day like a geographic specific thing there and in Queens? was yes. op- So like opening day yesterday in New York, was it opening day in New York or because the Yankees weren't there and they were playing in Houston? Is it opening day? Like where is opening day? Just something to think about, something to chew on. Yeah, I mean, it certainly messes with some of our terminology and, and references and whatnot. Um, but I've said this before. I mean, home openers are, are a massive deal as well. And I, I'm glad that, that cities take those seriously, yeah. too, even if you don't get to do it on the capital O, capital D opening day. So we were both in attendance, as we just told you, for games on opening day. And it's I don't want to sit here and be like, oh, my God, it's so hard being at an opening day baseball game. <laughs> however, however, it does make it more difficult to follow what is going on in the rest of the league because, like, you are obviously, understandably, going to watch the game in front of you. And because of how the schedule played out yesterday and we had one three o'clock start that I was at and then, like, eight four o'clock starts, there are literally not enough screens and not enough yeah. press box Wi-Fi to keep track of everything that's going on. <laughs> and so right. like I watched the Orioles game, wrote about the Orioles game, came back to the hotel and then just watched like the long highlight package of every game with no, really no knowledge of what had gone on. However, I now feel capable of talking about most of these baseball games. And that's what we're going to do. Give every fan base a little taste. All right, so we'll go, I'll I'll follow your lead here because it seems like if you've actually watched full highlights of every game, you are more qualified to talk about all of them than I am. But I am excited to at least uh, sprinkle in some thoughts um, on all of these teams. Cool. Now, and and I will say too. So again, if we miss some details, sorry, we were trying to do our jobs. I'm so excited to just sit on the couch this weekend and consume as much as I possibly can in in a, in a way that I'm more uh, comfortable with. Um, but remember, people, uh, I I looked this up last year. Five of the playoff teams lost on opening day. So if you are despondent this morning, if you are feeling like your season is doomed, you're, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. At some point, you, you know, you're 0-3, you're 0-4, you're 0-5. Okay, now you can start to panic. 0-1, you can persevere. So let's. we're not going to take any grand conclusions on this. This is more just the moments that stuck with us from opening day. You hear that, Rockies fans? Stay positive. You can go 0-1 and make the playoffs. We will not start with the Rockies. We will start in Kansas City where the Royals took on the Twins. Uh, Andy Reid throwing out the first pitch, holding the Lombardi trophy. Did you see this? Nope. See, again, completely missed that. That's outstanding. Uh, I love to hear that. Uh, again, I uh, I wrote in my AL uh, Central preview, hoping that the Royals could be relevant late enough in the summer that Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift will show up to watch, quote, Diron Blanco and the boys. This is a good start. <laughs> <laughs> Dyron Blanco and the boys. It was a good reminder that the uh, Lombardi trophy, the NFL trophy, is much easier to hold with one hand mm. and oh, like yeah. do other tasks. Yeah. Whereas I could not imagine holding the World Series trophy in one hand and then throwing out a first pitch with the other. So no, maybe idea. we get like a handle on there. I don't know how we fix that. Uh we had a uh, Michael Garcia home run early on. We had a Royce Lewis home run early on for the true ball knowers out there. I mean, that was an, an unbelievable start to this game. But then for the real ball knowers out there, Royce Lewis left the game with an injury. He um, was like kind of like limping off the field, going uh, first to third, rounding second, stepped weird for a guy who had two reconstructive ACL surgeries. And then came back and was still as you know athletic in the box as he was before. Amazing. Homered earlier in this game, like you said. Um, after the game, Royce Lewis said that it felt like a cramp that wouldn't go away. I think it's in his quad. Um, and we'll see how it goes. But you should go read, like, read some of the dispatches of like how he was acting in the clubhouse after the game. Still yeah. positive. 
about his first opening day. Like Royce Lewis is just awesome, man. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully, again, as we're recording this early on Friday, we don't have any update there. Hopefully that's not significant for obvious reasons. Um, But yeah, I mean, otherwise it was it was, you know, Pablo Lopez was awesome and uh, Cole Reagans was also awesome. But uh, Royals offense, as we were maybe concerned, uh, maybe not the best. Carlos Correa looked really good yesterday. Just a reminder. I mean, it's nothing's conclusive. He could just be a little like healthier and be a five win player. Like he is still Carlos Correa. I, I, I can I just say I know some of this is is batting average and stolen bases. Having done some fantasy drafts, uh, you know, over the last week, it is incredible how low he is ranked. And I get it because of the season he's coming off of. But it's like what? Like it's not like this guy's like thirty seven and his career is over. Like if would anyone be shocked if he's an all star this year? No. And it was he was like ranked like two hundred and eightieth or something. It was wild. He is uh, available on waivers in our league, and I stared for a while at his name. Uh, and I'm uh, he he might be on my team. Uh, we'll see. At some point. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, we'll see how things go. All right, let's stay in the American League Central because we love the big markets. Uh, Tigers, White Sox, the return of broadcaster Jason Benetti to guaranteed rate. Jason, friend of the show, had been the White Sox play-by-play guy for very long. Left town over the offseason, escaped to Detroit, um, which, like, hell yeah, dog. Um, and previewing this game, we were like, wow, can't wait to watch Tarek Skubal. Garrett Crochet has never made a big league start. He's starting on opening day. This is going to be fascinating. And Crochet basically went punch for punch with Tarek Skubal. I- Yes, and again, like when we when we did our AL Central preview, like this is what I said, like yes, it's unreal that he's starting on opening day, and maybe that's not the best sign for the White Sox, but like he's a lefty who throws ninety nine, and that's exactly what he looked like yesterday. First time he threw six innings since uh, May eleventh, twenty nineteen, uh, pitching for Tennessee against Florida. So it has been five years since this man has gone anywhere close to as deep in this game, and that and that game he gave up seven runs. So for him to go, you know, six uh, and only one run in this game uh, was fantastic. And I'm so glad the White Sox fans have that because, my God, otherwise they look like one of the worst teams in baseball, which which is which is the plan. But to lose one nothing, to strike out 11 times and not draw a walk, this team – and this is a broader theme of the day. The bad teams are going to be very bad. I hope Crochet is good because when you are watching a bad team, Having one starting pitcher who oh. is nails that you it's... can just – you can tune out for four days. Like you can just <laughs> not watch your bad team drop the chili on the ground for four days. And then when it's crochet day, you can show up and watch. Jordan Schusterman, Mariners supporter, did this quite a bit with Mr. <laughs> Felix Hernandez. Uh, yeah. It is a a not horrible way to take in a bad team. Anyway, the Tigers win one to zero. Let's head down south to Miami, where the Pirates outlasted the Marlins in extra innings in a pretty wild one. Miami went up early. Pittsburgh clawed back and ends up winning in extras. I mean, let's just say it off off the rip here. 12 innings in modern baseball with the automatic runner is, is not common. I mean, to get the 12 inning game on opening day is is very unusual. Uh, a lot of fun moments in this game. A lot of sloppy moments for both teams. A lot of back and forth. But my two, I mean, we can zoom in on some of the some of the highlights of the game. But the two things that I'll take away from this game, you know, big picture, um, since you're probably better equipped to talk about the you know the play by play and the back and forth. The first is the Marlins losing a game like this a one run game on opening day with Luis Arise going 0 for 6 which for I believe the first 0 for 6 of his career was like uh oh <laughs> I was like oh no here we go this is this is all the regression uh, just just right off off the rip but the other thing the flip side for the for the buckos here is when they got that last out in the 12th inning and Brian Reynolds, you know, ranges back, makes the catch. And when they cut to Henry Davis with taking his mask off and dapping up Jose Hernandez, I was like, yes, this is what it's supposed to look like. When you draft a franchise catcher first overall, he should be franchise catching. 
And I remember those first games of Adley Rutschman, you know, closing out W's for the Orioles. And it's it just looks so right to have the face of your franchise kind of come and, and just be there on the mound. And with the t- it's just it's perfect. Like, that's what it's supposed to look like. I don't want Henry coming in from right field and de- like, no, no, no. That's what it's supposed to look like. Seeing the face of your franchise, like the face, after every win right away is really fun. That is cool. You are 100% right about that. I had somebody in baseball text me yesterday like, Henry Davis looks way better behind the plate Mm -hmm. defensively. He made big strides over the winter and in camp so that he could be good enough to catch back there. Really fun taste of what the Pirates could be. Have to mention, the O'Neill Cruz home run (laughs) yesterday was just stupid it looked like a foul ball pop-up that carried out if it had been hit by any other human being i would have been like the balls are juiced again but because it was o'neill cruz i'm more liable to believe the legitimacy of it yeah the two things there was like nick gordon ranges back and like he's kind of like like, what just happened like he like turns around sees the ball go over the fence and you you see him kind of like like, he's like what was that also six though being the one, like the leverage guy in the eighth inning was wild too. Um, like, I guess good for him, but you know, not again, it's not that was a, that wasn't Sixto's fault. Like, O'Neill's a freak. Um, but it was just anyway, yeah. that was that was wild. Just a worthwhile reminder that O'Neill Cruz can be the best player in the world. Okay. He can be that. There are only 15 humans who maybe, you know, who can be that. He is one of them. And what a start to the year for him. He was unbelievable in spring training. Let's hop to Houston. Yankees. Astros. It's like the ALCS forever. Um, this was an unbelievable win for the Yankees. Down 4-0, to coming all the way back. And beating the Astros. Comeback victory. Huge for morale in the Bronx. I can hear the hooting and hollering all the way down here in Baltimore flying through I-95. A um, couple of big notes here, like Nestor was fine. He was fine. Um, Oswaldo Cabrera with a hilariously clutch home run, kind of a forgotten character a little bit on this Yankees team to come in in that spot was just sensational. And then Juan Soto. Like Juan Soto is on the Yankees. Um, he's standing next to Aaron Judge. He's throwing guys out from the outfield. Like he's on the Yankees and it will never not be unbelievable um the two the, the shots of the two of them together was like oh wow like that yeah thing. yep and soto's you know march to 150 walks or whatever begins with with two free passes uh today or in, in on opening day and and then yeah it's it's hilarious that you know the first soto highlight they tweet is is a defensive play that is uh outstanding stuff so um you know not the cleanest game but the yankees will happily happily take that one gotta say I dig the new road unis, the new Yankees. Oh, road yeah, unis. You're I know like, maybe this is what it's supposed yeah, to look I do. Like. They got, <laughs> yeah, that's the New York I know. <laughs> My grandfather uh, growing up in this city, that was these were the Yankees he knew all about. Let me tell you. Um, so morale is high. I think morale is high in the Bronx. Yeah. All right. Who's next? For now, uh, let's yeah. move to let's stay in the American League East. Uh, Toronto, Tampa, down at the trap. Highlights here, Jose Barrios was sensational, and Vladimir Guerrero Jr. hit a ball uh, 450 feet. It was one of those 450-foot home runs where it's to dead center, and so it's not really about like how high up the stands mm. it lands. It's like about how high it bonks kind of mm. off of something and then ricochets back down. And you could see the camera angle like when it pans to center – and the ball's just like not in the frame at all. It's yeah. like, oh my God, he got that one good. Yeah. You know, so Statcast goes 450. I think Vlad and John Schneider after the game were like, that's more than 450. Uh, <laughs> but Vlad's like, I don't care. A home run's a home run. Uh, so that was great to see. Uh, overshadowing an, an incredibly fun Yandi leadoff home run that, you know, the Rays offense yeah, did back up after that. Yandi looks fantastic. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Brios was good. It was, it was nice to see that for Toronto. And, and yeah, I mean, as far as morale goes, if you're drawing up a Blue Jays opening day win, it's it's Brios throwing well and Vlad hitting a ball to the moon. So good good for the Jays. San Diego hosting the San Francisco Giants. Just a couple quick things here. Uh, the Did you see the Logan Webb sinker that moved the entire <laughs> length of the plate? I mean, I mean listen, 
that's what he does. Like, I, I mean, yes, this one was particularly uh, shocking uh, visually, um, but like that's that's it why moved Logan two Webb feet. Is, it moved two it's, feet. <laughs> In the other direction, right? We're so used to like, the other way. oh, if you can, if you can really rip it, right? If you can really rip a slider like sweepers now, right? The horizontal movement is like, oh my gosh, it's amazing the, the how far over the ball will go. Um, to get that kind of arm side movement is really, really freaky stuff. It reminded me of what I believe to be the greatest pitch of the 21st century. I'm sure you know what we're talking about. Uh, the Daniel Bard uh, freakazoid so, okay. uh, 98 mile an hour change up sinker that he threw to Nick Swisher in like 2011. So, yes. Reference. And like some people are like, what are you talking about? Like what? This is like very early with pre-pitching ninja pitching gifts. And I agree that that's that why it pitch still that, that pitch still ages well. But like also, man, like that's kind of. We got, you know, Yolanda Duran throwing 101 mile an hour splinkers or whatever. Like that is all too normal now. So uh, that is just the baseball. With all due respect anyway, to yeah. defam- with all due respect to Defamation Ninja, like <laughs> pitching gifts from the pre-pitching ninja era yes. in my head, yes. like stand out a little bit more. Like the U like Darvish. The overlaid one of like U Darvish. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because uh, it was if you know, you know. Yeah, it just mm. if you know, you know, you know. <sighs> uh anyway, uh Great win for the Padres. Yep. A two-run RBI single from the Crone Zone late, giving the hometown dads the win. Good reminder, like, if Jake Cronenworth can be what he was a couple years ago and not like a below-average offensive first baseman, that's another um, piece in this lineup that could be huge for the Padres. Yes, last note on this game uh, before we move on to the Dodgers. Uh, 18 consecutive different opening day left fielders for the San Francisco Giants since Barry Bonds is one of the best fun facts we have in our sport. And Michael Conforto, you know, hitting home run, he he he's you know p- keeping keeping that streak alive. And and because of his contract status, I feel great about Michael Conforto not being the opening day left fielder in 2025. So let's let's keep it going, Giants. <laughs> is he a free agent at the end of the year? Yeah, this is a two-year deal, right? So this is his second. I mean, I could check that, but yeah, I mean, he's. I mean, again, if he's amazing, like again, I don't see any scenario where he is their opening day left fielder next year. So we're in good shape. He could be a right field. That's fine, just not in left. Amazing, love to hear that. Uh, okay, Dodgers, Cardinals. We talked about this a lot. Uh, Miles Michaelis, who had some hilarious comments about how the Dodgers were playing checkbook baseball and the Cardinals were just a bunch of. Midwestern farm boys doing their best. Uh, should have spent a little bit more money, Miles, because uh, the Dodgers took you behind the woodshed. Oh, my God. Oh, man. Chalk one up for the coastal elites as the Dodgers Woo! just pantsing them. I mean, we got we got a Mookie Homer. We got a Freddie Homer. We got some Otani. Yeah, Otani already delivering a harder hit ball than any Dodger had all of last season. It was exactly as you expected. Glass now looks tremendous. Um, and and yeah, I mean, the only highlight for the uh, St. Louis Cardinals is that Victor Scott stole, stole his first of what will be many, 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 many stolen bases in 2024. Did you see that Miles Michaelis and Steven Matz were at the March Madness game after their loss last night? I did not. I did not. What I did see, more importantly, uh, is that I am in exquisite shape in our Yahoo bracket pool uh, after the Illinois and Alabama wins last night. I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but I, if Tennessee wins today, I am probably going to win this bracket. Okay, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Beast. Uh, yeah, just the image of Miles Michaelis like getting. Now, I'm not saying he shouldn't get to have fun no, 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 after no. he lost, but it is still funny to see. Yes. Like him get bludgeoned by the Dodgers and then just like be a, a March Madness game like hours later. It's just funny. That's fine. Um, live your life, Miles. Okay. Oh, and one is fine. You can come back. Live your life, Miles. <clears throat> the primetime game, Cubs, Rangers, super weird one. We had a uh, Justin Steele injury on a defensive mm. play early on. He had to leave after four and two thirds. Hopefully he's okay. It's kind of a weird looking one. Yavaldi was pretty solid. Game was tied late and with a runner on second, I think Michael Bush was on second. Ball in the dirt that was tipped by the hitter and Jonah Heim, the Rangers catcher, like 
couldn't block it because it was tipped and the ball kind of squirted away. And instead of going to pick up the ball, he started arguing with the umpire about it being a foul ball. Michael Bush, the runner, goes from second heads up play all the way to home and beats the throw, takes two bases on the pass ball. They can't review that play, apparently, um, even though it was clearly tipped. That happens, I think, in the ninth inning. And it's like, oh, man, are the Cubs really going to win like that on opening day? No, they're not. Because Shakira met Travis Jankowski, and Travis Jankowski hit one big long gone in the bottom of the ninth to tie the game for the Texas Rangers in offense with so much power. And it is Travis Jankowski who does it. Oh, ties the game in the ninth with a homer, and then the Rangers win it on a Jonah Heim two out double, I think in the 11th, to give the World Series champion Texas Rangers an opening day walk off win. So Travis Jankowski is incredible because he's basically their Jake Cave, right? That is what he was for them last year. And I mean, you could I say he played that even is more than that. Disrespectful. That's disrespectful to Travis Jankowski because he can play center field. Okay. Was Jake JK wasn't playing literally any center field? Okay, anyway, the point is, is for Travis Jankowski to to find his way back onto this roster. Um, and then to have that moment is, is is incredible. But that's it is a great reminder of just like those guys. Uh, if if you if you got the right people liking you, um, <laughs> you're you're in good shape. Already matching his home run total from last year uh, did Travis Jankowski. Uh, and then of course, Wyatt Langford making his debut is is amazing because he was an always five good ago. to see the defending champions wear the gold trimmed uniforms on opening day. That's a nice touch. I really like that other sports don't do. I think that the team that wins the World Series should get to wear those uniforms like every Saturday or something for the entire season after they've won the World Series and not just the opening weekend. I think that'd be a good little touch. All right, three more games. These are the late games. Cleveland, Oakland. Um, Alex Wood was not good. The Guardians offense uh, knocked him around in the middle innings. Uh, Shane Bieber was phenomenal. And the main story at the Coliseum was the boycott going on outside. There were only 13,000 people inside the stadium for opening day, which is the lowest total in Oakland, pandemic seasons aside, since the 70s. Embarrassing. The gates were not open until like an hour before the game. The ownership group in Oakland clearly despises the fans who have decided to fight back against the A's moving to Vegas. The atmosphere outside in the parking lot seemed to be really interesting, really powerful, really emotional. A lot of tears, a lot of people kind of coming to grips with the fact that the team they love, like this is their last opening day in Oakland, really a sad, melancholy day. And it's no surprise that the team uh, that has been neglected on the field uh, was undermanned and overmatched. Yeah. And again, we we try and do our best to separate what is happening on the field. And I, I mean, not that it's not related. We know that. But we, yeah. we you know, it's it's hard to to put so much on these players that are just, you know, literally doing their best in a really crappy situation. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, they're, they're, that's all of it has been neglected and, and it's, it's, it's a, it's a pretty somber start to what is going to be a tough, a tough go here. So still relevant story. Um, and I don't want to overreact, overreact too much because of the lineup he was facing, but boy, this paper, I mean, he looks fantastic in spring. He's throwing harder for sure. Um, and that's just, yeah, I mean, I've been saying it all preseason, but, if him and McKenzie are, are healthy, that is not a team to take lightly, regardless of David Fry batting fifth and DHing and Austin Hedges starting on opening day. <laughs> but, yep. You know, uh, I'm glad. I'm just saying, I'm glad if Austin Hedges is going to start, that Shane Bieber throws an absolute gem. You know, like if yeah. if we're going to start Austin Hedges, I need an Austin pitching performance because otherwise, I'm going to be angry that Bo Naylor's not playing. Bieber is one of the uh, two early contenders for the. He went to Jared. He went to Driveline award for players who show up at the driveline facility in Seattle over the winter and then have new magical superpowers because they are training smart instead of just, you know, feeling it out. Uh, and so Bieber is one of them. He's throwing a lot harder. The other is Paul Goldschmidt, who I think he had like harder hit balls or faster bat speed numbers in like his opening day game than like he had compared to like all of last year. And so wow. it's clear that that's a legitimate change. I am yeah. now deciding to buy high uh, or buy low on gold. I think he's actually going to be pretty good, even though I picked him as the old guy to disappoint. Uh, <laughs> let's pivot to uh, the football game. Uh, 
the Diamondbacks against the Rockies. I guess it's not a football game because it was 16 to 1. You can't score one in football, but you certainly can score 16. Uh, and what was notable about this is that the Arizona Diamondbacks put up a good old 14 spot against the Rockies yeah. in the third, the second inning? Third inning? Third inning. Uh, third inning. Third inning. So they they put up two, you know, Gurriel Homers in the first. They don't score in the second. And then a 14 run inning with with no home runs is is really something special. Kyle Freeland for the Rockies, who absolutely tanked your opening day starter draft. He was throwing harder than he had in like five years. And uh, that seemed to be a bad strategy as the D-backs were simply teeing off. They bring in their rule five pick, Anthony Molina, uh, for a rather unfortunate major league debut, allowing six runs, getting one out. And uh, yeah, I mean, the snakes, the snakes were alive. The Rockies were the opposite of that. The D-backs uh, finished the game with 18 hits. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight players had a multi-hit game. That feels like a thing. That and, <laughs> and Corbin Carroll had zero hits. So a very funny, uh, funny box score for this game. Not much else to add, but obviously good vibes uh, in the desert. I'll say this. Don't allow 14 runs in an inning. It's just not the move. It's like mathematically feels like should not even be possible with major league pitching. But I mean, it's tough to overcome that in a game. Yeah, that's a huge, like, really takes the wind out of your sails. <laughs> can you do me uh, a favor? Rockies, yeah. Can you ask Sarah Langs? Ask Sarah Langs, how often have teams allowed 14 runs in an inning and won the game? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, fortune rest <laughs> innings only happened like 10 times ever or whatever. So uh, probably not very often. You'll say 0 and 10. That's a great Sarah Lang tweet. Teams are now 0 and 10 in games <laughs> in which they allow 14 runs in a single inning. Um, a hilarious thing, right? The energy in a dugout after you allow 14 runs in a single inning, because in any game, when you get the final out, it is like this very miniature celebration of like, okay, now good things are happening to us. And in college baseball, there's this very generic cliche thing that happens when after you allow runs, people come to the dugout and someone will say, all right, now we go. Now it's our turn. Now mm-hmm. we hit. All right. Now we're now we now get the bats moving. Like yeah. they, yeah. they can hit. We can hit too. Pass Do you think the, the Rockies Everybody dugout hits. after this, after the uh, allowed 14 is like, all right, let's put up 15 boys. Uh, I don't know. Let's respond. Uh, no, I don't think that's what happened. Uh, the Seattle Mariners are 0 and 1. They lost 6 to 4 to the Red Sox of Boston in what was, a, thankfully, a, a pretty close game. Uh, the Red Sox kind of kept pulling away. Mariners trying to, to push back. Uh, they kind of gave, you know, Seattle gave just enough moments where you were like, I mean, the Mitch Hanniger home run with Felix Hernandez in the booth was extremely cool. And amazing in terms that of was uh, for morale, that was fantastic. Castillo was fine, um, but the offense was not uh, good enough in the early going to stay in it. Uh, some of their more anonymous relievers were not as sharp late in the game as uh, Tyler O'Neill makes Major League Baseball history, becoming the first ever player to homer in five consecutive opening days. That is a ridiculous fact. It's also like, wait a minute, Tyler O'Neill's been healthy for five consecutive opening days. Bingo. Uh, and apparently the answer like, is what? yes. And now he will go for six next year for a team that is probably not the Red Sox, as he will be a free agent after this year. Um, but he could be a healthy version of him, could be a very, very important part of their team. And I know we're all burying the Red Sox before the season begins, and that's fine. I understand why. Um, I don't think they're going to suck, uh, but we'll see how long they don't suck. Uh, and Tyler O'Neill could be a big part of that. Other than that, I mean, it was whatever. It was There was some dumb Mariner stuff like, the play that <laughs> second and third grounded to Josh Rojas at third Tyler O'Neill's comes home. They throw it home and it just clanks off Tyler O'Neill's head. And I was like, Oh yeah, Mariners baseball. So back baby, like defensive miscues. You can't even dream of. This is the best. I'm so excited to be watching this again. Uh, but no, I, I just had to laugh and the Mitch Hanniger home run uh, kept my spirits up. So I ain't too worried. Uh, Jordan, you mentioned this earlier, but the opening day starter draft that we did, I mean, we can go through the numbers <laughs> if you want, or we don't have to. I got worked. I got destroyed. And that was mostly like, I think I still maybe would have lost if not for Kyle Freeland's 10 runs in two innings. Like, yes. I, and I would have again, needed help today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, like, you did pick Kyle Freeland. Like, 
he you picked between him and Nestor at the end of the draft. <laughs> and you went with him. <laughs> and so that was a choice. Now he was your last pick. Um, did does that mean that I expected him to give up 10 runs? No. Um, but it's not like you were technically stuck with him. Nestor kind of, I mean, the reason why I really give myself is I got, I got unbelievable performances from Montas and Crochet, but th- this is how, you know, you, you got stomped here is you have three starters still left today. I mean, I still have Strider and they could all go CG, uh, shutout and if Strider gives up three runs without getting it out. And I think my team still wins. So, uh, unfortunately Kyle Freeland and Alex Wood uh, really sunk your team, but it was fun. I'm glad we did it. I, I hope uh, people enjoyed following along. We should do this for random days of the season. Like we should just do this again on like on on like Fridays or something every once we in could. a while. We could if we, I mean this list because was full doing slates. it with the opening day yeah. starters is cool. Doing it with the opening day starter is cool because it's like all the best starters. But there's also something funny about not doing that. Yeah, when it's like, not it's like oh man, I guess I'll like take all- Jake Irvin. The opposite, right? It's like on some random Friday in May and it's all the five starters. Like, I agree. That actually could be uh, a fun. Fridays would be a good uh, a good way to do that with like a full slate. So, hey, good idea, Jake Mintz. Let's uh, let's come back to that one. Or terrible idea. Some people are like, what What the heck? Why do I want to listen to you draft? <laughs> I don't want to listen to you draft bad starters. I'm like, are you kidding me? Do you know us? That's like totally our thing. Um, anyway, uh, we will end this podcast here. Uh, thank you, Jake, for, for waking up early with me. Thank you to producer Andrew Hart. We hope everyone enjoyed their opening day. If your favorite team has not played yet, we hope you enjoy opening day, um, on Friday. We hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. You can email us at baseballbarbercast at gmail.com. And we will be back uh, on Monday with more of this, this podcast. And we will not be in hotel rooms. Thanks for listening. Talk to you soon.